All right. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the League of Women Voters Forum on 50 ways, oh no, 70 ways to beat climate change. I'm Jeff Canberra, the vice president in charge of programs. And we've got a very interesting program for tonight and obviously very relevant with climate change. Normally, as a moderator, I would tell you where the bathroom is, but hopefully you're in the uh, comfort of your own home and know where that is. You can get water and you can take a break anytime you'd like. So with that, I think we're going to get started, and I'm going to introduce our current president of the League of Women Voters. In my lower right-hand corner is President Anne McCarrigan. Thank you, Jeff, and good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Joyce, thank you so much for the presentation you're about to give. It's, I'm sure, going to be very interesting. So for those who are not familiar with the League of uh, Women Voters here in Alameda, just would like to take this opportunity to let you know we have been serving Alameda since 1978. Our mission is to empower voters and defend democracy. Um, and our vision is a democracy where every person has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate. So um, we have a very robust um, organization and always look forward to having uh, newer members. If you're not currently a member, please consider visiting our website, which is lwvalameda.org, where you can find out more about us, become a member. And when you become a member of your local league, you also automatically become a member of your state and national league. Um, you can also make a contribution. We um, are a completely um, volunteer organization, so any support always helps. But, you know, you often hear of the league doing work related to voting and such services, but we also... Um, advocate strongly for very for different uh, public policy issues, and the in, the environment has been something that has been a uh, something the National League and all others have been working on since the 1960s. So this very much um, relates to the work that we do. And so once again, thank you all for attending, and um, look forward to this evening's presentation. Great, thank you very much. Also, I want to do two other introductions. Um, in the upper left-hand corner with the League of Women Voters of Alameda, nice backdrop, is Keisha Martindale, and she is taking care of the technology tonight. So if it automatically goes out or the sound or anything, call Keisha, she'll be able to help you out. And then there's Carol Kasperic, and she is managing the chat for me tonight because I have a hard time multitasking. And so with that, you can put any of your questions in the chat. And I believe that our speaker will also be putting a link in there later on uh, to get to um, the checklist of 70. So with that, I think we are ready to go. As part of its position at both the local, state, and national level, the League of Women Voters is already working on a crucial solution to the climate crisis. And that is getting people out to vote. However, we will not get through the crisis without strong environmental minded politicians in office. Unfortunately, politicians can face well funded, well organized pressure campaigns to ignore the climate reality. The more you know about the details of the climate crisis, the more you'll be able to convince people to vote and advocate effectively for those in office. Climate reality affects our everyday lives through drought, food, supply, sea level rise, fires, and the survival of nature. Today's presentation will cover the severity of the crisis, the solutions, and the surprisingly simple things we can do about it. As part of her presentation, our speaker will outline an extensive list of things each of us can do to reduce our contribution to the climate crisis. Tonight, we are honored to have Joyce Mercado present on the subject of climate change. Joyce earned her Bachelor of Science degree in physics from California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo and studied plasma physics for two years at Princeton University. She worked for IBM for 35 years as the North American Technical Sales Manager before retiring in, and Joyce, was it 2020? 2019. 2019, beat the COVID, right? Just yeah. by a year. Recently, she completed climate reality project training led by Al Gore and joined thousands of other climate reality leaders to give climate protection presentations like the one tonight. 
Joyce currently works as the Bike Walk Alamitas Program Administrator. She is an active member of the Community Action for Sustainable Alameda, where she writes a monthly column on climate protection for the Alameda Sun and created the CASA Climate Protection Checklist, a checklist and Resource List. In her spare time, Joyce enjoys bird watching and giving back to her community in a variety of volunteer capacities. So if we could give a bunch of finger snaps and welcome Joyce Mercado. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff and, and Anne. And I appreciate all of Keisha's work on promoting this and Carol for helping with the question and answers. And um, I've always admired the League of Women Voters for the good work that you do. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight. So let me go into the screen share. And check those special boxes. Yes, I did. Now, can you all see that? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Well, it's not letting me advance. Yep. Lower left oh, hand corner. Is. There you now go. Now it is. Okay. Yeah. So the agenda I'm going to go over tonight is the causes of climate change, proof points that the global temperatures are increasing, the impacts of global climate change, the fact that we've got solutions available now, we don't have to invent anything to solve this crisis. And then lastly, but most important, um, develop a personal action plan of things you can do to protect the climate. This is a picture from an Apollo mission. It shows the Earth and the blue band there, that thin blue band is our atmosphere. It's not nearly as vast as we imagine. It's a pretty um, thin blue line that surrounds the Earth. And how does um, global warming work in the first place? We have the sun's radiation hitting the Earth and 48% of its energy is absorbed by the Earth's surface. 23% is um, uh, absorbed in the atmosphere and reflected back to Earth. And then 29% gets um, sent out, back out into outer space. And this is a good thing because it keeps the Earth warm and habitable, but it's a very delicate balance. And the problem we have is that we've been disrupting that delicate balance by spewing 152 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into that thin blue shell that I showed you every 24 hours. So what that does is as you've got more CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, more of the radiation is trapped in the um, atmosphere or reflected back to Earth thereby causing global warming. So that's basically how global warming works. So what are the sources of these greenhouse gases? The biggest sources are demonstrated here. <clears throat> From a global perspective, 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions are due to electricity production, burning of fossil fuels for electricity production. 24% coming in really close to electricity is food and agricultural and land use. 21% is industry. 14% is transportation. 6% is buildings. And 10% is uh, other sources like um, oil refining and uh, the thawing of the permafrost. <clears throat> the largest source of global warming pollution is the burning of fossil fuels. And you can see this really took off after World War II. And in fact, we're producing more um, carbon dioxide in, now than in the past 66 million years. This graph shows the illustration between the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in blue and the temperature of the earth in white. And you can see there's a pretty strong correlation between the two. And the problem is, is now we're up to about 415 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So it has really shot up, which does not bode well for the temperature. This is being a scientist, this is the chart that really grabbed my attention 
when I saw it in National Geographic many years ago and got, convinced me that I need to do more to protect the climate than change a few light bulbs. I got out my bike and I got involved with CASA and with Bike Walk Alameda. So <clears throat> 20, 19 of the 20th hottest years on record have occurred since the year 2001. And the hottest of all have been in the, the last five years. And this needs to be updated to include 2021. It's even worse at the poles. Um, the temperature at the North, North Pole was 50 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than normal in February of 2018. And a similar thing is happening in Antarctica, where the temperature reached almost 70 degrees Fahrenheit in February of 2020, a new record for Antarctica. So the next thing I'm gonna discuss is the impacts of global climate change. And this part can be rather disturbing because there are, there's a wide variety of, of impacts that are, are um, quite disturbing. But I want you to keep in mind, we're gonna to get to the solution section and also what we can do about it section. So first off, I'd like to cover um, Antarctic ice loss. This shows the ice loss per year in billion metric tons and you can see that it is accelerating over the decades. We're losing ice much more rapidly now than we were back in the 70s or 80s. And we also have a decline in ice mass in Greenland. So it's going down severely as well. And as that ice melts, the water has to go somewhere. So it goes in the ocean and it ends up with sea level rise. So these are the top 10 cities at risk from sea level rise in 2070. And you can see Miami is one of them, but Miami is already experiencing sea level rise. This is a video. This is the ninth sunny day in Miami Beach, 2015. No storm, no um, hurricane, just the, all the water is just uh, from a high tide. In fact, this Kiribati is the first nation to purchase land in another country to house its climate refugees. So this is an island in the Pacific Ocean and they're gonna go underwater before, so they're locating um, their citizens elsewhere. As the earth heats up, the um, ocean has been heating up as well. This shows um, the uh, heat content by depth in the ocean. And you can see that half of this increase has occurred in the last 20 years. So again, another point of acceleration of the problem. Hey, Joyce, just for your information, that little gray square, rectangular square has oh. popped back up, at least on my screen. Oh, it's gone. Okay. Thanks, Keisha. <laughs> um, so how does this, how does the uh, climate crisis impact hurricanes? The warmer oceans lead to more intense hurricanes. Hurricanes intensify much more rapidly with the increased temperature. The warmer the air is, the more moisture it holds, leading to heavier downpours. <clears throat> and because of the sea level rise, you get bigger storm surges. And there's new evidence too that there's a, a wavier jet stream can hold storms in place longer. And this is exactly what happened with Hurricane Harvey that hit Houston. As the, as the hurricane crossed the waters in the Gulf of Mexico, they were seven degrees Fahrenheit hotter than normal, up to 200 meters deep. And this caused this hurricane to hit Houston and stay in place for five days, dumping over 30 inches of rain. So that led to catastrophic flooding in Houston. Here's an evacuee from um, the Hurricane Harvey. And in fact, if you looked at over time between um, May 2000, 
15 and 2019, we've had Houston has experienced three and one 500 year floods and two one in 1000 year floods. So these events that are supposed to be happening and frequently are rarely are happening with frequency. The warmer air can hold a lot more hot water vapor. With each additional one degree of temperature, the atmosphere's capacity to hold the water vapor increases by 7%. So there's already 5% more water vapor over the oceans than there was only 30 years ago. And then you get these things called rain bombs. This is one in Midland, Texas. So it's not a hurricane, it's just a, a, an, an, an immense amount of water that's dumped all at once from the heavens. And um, rains like this have caused severe flooding all over the world. Here's an example in Germany, where it killed at least 220 people in July of last year. This is England in 2020, when they had a, one of these weather bombs hit. In fact, 2020 was UK's wettest day on record on October 3rd. Here's another one in Mexico. Not a hurricane, just a rain bomb. And then the same heat that evaporates more water from the ocean, causing bigger downpours and floods, evaporates the uh, moisture from the soil, causing longer and deeper droughts. So here, this is uh, looking at last year, 78% of the West, U.S. West is experiencing moderate to exceptional drought. Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada are particularly hard hit. So you can see the darker the red, the more exceptional the drought. And um, so it's not just California, it's a good portion of the U.S. West. 93% of California is currently in drought. This is affecting groundwater levels in Europe. The darker the red, the lower the groundwater um, percentile. And you can see it's, um, Europe is in, in bad shape when it comes to groundwater supplies. And droughts lead to famine. Here we have more than 1 million people in Madagascar are facing famine due to food insecurity due to back-to-back -back droughts. The fire season in the West has gotten longer and climate change has impacted this in a few different ways. One, spring is starting earlier and summer's lasting longer, so elongating the season. Um, the drier temperatures, the droughts uh, dry up the plants so that they burn more readily. The warmer the air, the more likely you have lightning strikes. Then there's some new information out saying that um, the increase in temperatures also lead to stronger winds, which exacerbates the fires. So, and this isn't just happening in the West, it's happening all over the world. Here is in um, Spain, where they had uh, fires fueled going across all of Spain in August of last year. August of last year, uh, Turkey had a, seven day period where more than 130 forest fires ignited in Turkey. This is in Argentina, thousands of hectares in Argentina, in Australia. So it's happening all over the world. This chart shows extreme weather catastrophes um, uh, it, with red is the extreme temperatures, droughts, and fires. Blue is floods and mudslides, and that yellow color is storms. And you can see if you compare 2018 to, to, to 1980, we're about four times as more likely to have these extreme weather catastrophes. So it's increasing. This is from the U.S. Department of Defense. Climate change will likely lead to food and water shortages, pandemic disease, disputes over refugees and resources, and destruction by natural disasters in regions across the globe. How does climate change affect the food supply? Lots of different ways. I'll just touch on a couple of them. One is obviously the droughts. So when you have a drought, wheat yields go down. 
um, uh, diseases thrive. So the wheat leaf rust, which thrives in higher temperatures and humidity can lead to crop losses of 20 to 30% or more. And this um, leaf rust is moving north as the temperatures are increasing. These are the four grains that feed, uh, that provide two thirds of humic caloric intake. And these are the projected yield declines for each one degree Celsius of warming. So this does not bode well for our ability to feed humanity. How does climate change affect health? Well, we've already discussed food insecurity. Let's see what else we have. Unfortunately, heat waves are deadly. We had a heat wave in Japan in 2018 where 138 people um, died from it. More than half of the people in the U.S. live in counties that don't meet EPA air quality standards. That one's surprising. I didn't realize it was quite that bad. This is New Delhi, India. Um, very polluted air. Roughly 1.24 million people died in 2017 from air pollution deaths in, in India. Climate change also increases the risk of many waterborne infectious diseases like these listed here. And in fact, in the US, um, two thirds of the last outbreaks of waterborne infectious diseases were preceded by heavy precipitation events. Um, the oceans are getting more acidic. Basically how this works is you have with the uh, additional carbon dioxide that's in the air gets absorbed by, some of it gets absorbed by the ocean and makes carbonic acid. And this is dissolving the shells of tiny free swimming um, snails that provide food for the bigger fish. So we're disrupting the food chains in the ocean. Um, similarly, the Great Barrier Reef has lost half of its coral cover in the last 30 years and 30% just since 2016. So again, another acceleration of the problem. And fish species are at risk too by the end of the century because as the water in, uh, temperature increases, it gets too hot to support the spawning and embryonic life stages of the fish. We now risk to lose risk losing up to 50% of all land-based species in this century, in part due to climate change. So you can see the costs of carbon are, are wide and pretty dire. In fact, it's the number one threat to the global economy. This chart illust uh, illustrates um, the uh, amount of carbon dioxide emitted in gigatons is on the vertical axis and time is on the horizontal axis. So it shows historical emissions. And then in the pink, that's the pre-Paris um, Agreement uh, uh, place we were headed, 3.6 to 4.2 degrees Celsius increase of projected warming by 2011. Then if you look at the, uh, the next bar down, band down, that's the um, current policies of countries would lead to about 2.7 to 3.1 degrees Celsius. Then the most recent um, meeting last year of the, uh, the countries at COP26, I think it was called, that's the pledged amount that people pledge. It still would lead to 2.1 to 2.4 degrees Celsius increase. And the um, pathway to get to less than 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is what scientists say we need to do to avoid the most catastrophic effects of climate change, we uh, is still even below what we've got pledged. So we have to do more than what the countries currently have pledged to solve this crisis. But the good news is we have solutions at hand to solve the crisis. The cost of clean energy technologies in the U.S. is going down. So this is a, shows a 59% decrease in residential solar, 
a 74% decrease in utility scale solar, 75% in wind reduction, uh, a reduction of 82% in, uh, in, for EV batteries, and LED light bulbs have gone down 94%. In fact, if you look at the unsubsidized cost of energy in the US, renewable energy, it comes out much less than conventional sources of energy. Then as a result, global wind energy capacity has gone up. As the prices go down, the um, capacity has been going up. Here is Brandenburg, Germany, where renewables produce 56% of Germany's electricity in the first half of 2020. Well, world solar installations have gone up even more rapidly than wind. In Australia, um, over 20% of the houses have solar panels on them. And the low entry cost of solar makes it very attractive for developing countries. This is a um, gas uh, powered plant in Romeland, California, and they're going to um, discontinue it ahead of schedule, 20 years ahead of schedule, because it can't compete with wind and solar electricity. This is US coal plants that were proposed and defeated. These are existing plants that were retired. And these are ones with the retirement that's announced. So we're, we've gone a long ways towards canceling coal in, in the US. Electric cars, we're getting more electric cars on the road. You can see that's increased dramatically since 2010. And these are countries that are planning a fossil fuel vehicle phase out. So quite a few countries. Wish the US was one of them. And it used to be that just a few, a handful of um, manufacturers build electric vehicles, but now everybody's building electric vehicles. And GM has announced that they are going to phase out gasoline and diesel powered vehicles by 2035. They're going to be all electric. And more and more people are getting on their bicycles. Um, this really, bicycling really took off during the pandemic. There was a shortage of bicycles because so many people were purchasing bicycles to get around town. The LED lights um, usage has gone way up. And we're doing more retrofitting of uh, buildings for energy efficiency. So almost a trillion dollars of investment between 2014 and 2023 from a global perspective. Over 180 global companies have made a commitment to go to 100% renewable. And here are those com companies. So quite a few different companies, a wide variety. And in 2020, the World Economic Forum launched a global initiative to plant 1 trillion trees and they're well on their way. This is a um, video of a climate protest at the UN when, they, when we had a, a climate summit there and over 300,000 people showed up to protest and encourage good, strong action on climate protection. Then talking about what's happening in the city itself, locally, the city of Alameda has um, developed a zero waste plan and we've got the last measurement that we took was a diversion rate of 79% in July of 2018. So that's not too bad. <clears throat> As of the beginning of this year, Alameda Municipal Power became 100% renewable for their energy resources. The city has put in an ordinance where that will require all electric new construction with EV chargers. And then the um, new Cruzy Rec Center constructed all, was constructed all electric and they swapped out the gas appliances at the West End Library to electric. The Line 78 is the new bus route to the Sea Pain Lagoon Ferry. We've got 50 miles of bikeways total in Alameda. 
and a gas powered leaf blower van is going to affect going into effect the beginning of next year. And we've got 19,500 city trees planted. So the city's been doing quite a lit, quite a bit towards meeting its climate protection objectives. Bike Walk Alameda is a nonprofit in town, and their um, goal is to, to do um, bicycling advocacy to promote more bicycling and walking in, in Alameda. One thing that they do is hold an annual Bike to Wherever Day. Um, it's coming up May 20th. <clears throat> And the, the idea behind this day is to encourage people to bicycle that may not do it uh, as an everyday practice to get out there, try it out in a supportive environment. <clears throat> we advocated with the city to get the shoreline cycle track down by South Shore, the Cross Alameda Trail that goes from Jean Sweeney Park all the way to the new Seaplane Lagoon Ferry. We got a Grant, Grand and Otis protected intersection and played a big role in slow streets. Community Action for Sustainable Alameda was established in 2018. And some of the accomplishments of this organization are, um, we have this, the Alameda Climate Protection Checklist and Resource List that I'm gonna go over in a few minutes here. <clears throat> the, a monthly column in the sun uh, reusable food containers restaurant campaign. We've got about five, camp, five restaurants signed up for that. And we played a big role in climate action and the resiliency plan adopted by the city. 100,000 Trees for Humanity is another nonprofit in town and they're all about planting trees. Our Rotary Club um, planted 15 trees in Tillman Park in cooperation with 100,000 Trees for Humanity. It's a great organization. <coughs> Excuse me. Alameda Backyard Growers um, is all about growing vegetables and, safe and preventing food waste. <coughs> they have a free seed library program in town where they have little kiosks with seeds in them, which reduces, um, by growing your own fruits and vegetables, you reduce food miles, which helps protect the climate. And then avoiding food waste, they gleaned over 8,000 pounds in 2020 from trees that would have otherwise gone to waste and donated to the Alameda Food Bank. <laughs> they have informational meetings about gardening and they have an article series in the Alameda Sun as well. So, we have all the solutions at hand. Now let's discuss next what we can do as individuals to um, reduce our carbon footprints and to influence others to reduce theirs. <clears throat> so I put in the chat the link to this checklist. So you can download it later and print it off. There's really two parts to the checklist. First, there's the checklist part about things you can do to reduce your carbon footprint and protect the environment. And the second page is a resource list of things organized in the same categories to help you do all the things on the checklist. So <clears throat> the resource list is quite helpful. Um, there was a study done in Alameda a few years back about the sources of the greenhouse gas emissions. And um, the uh, biggest area turned out to be transportation. It came in at 70% of our greenhouse gas emissions was transportation. So the most important thing to do is <clears throat> to figure out how to drive less. So biking or walking, taking public transit, carpooling for more than just work, but for kids activities, meetings and such, working for home, from home if possible, and making your next car an electric car. Then when you do drive, it's important to try to drive efficiently. And a couple of pointers there are to clean out items from your trunk um, so you're not carrying around excess weight because the more weight the car is, the less efficient it is. Um, <clears throat> check your tire pressure monthly. That can save 3% of your gas bill. 
keep regular vehicle maintenance schedule, you know, go the speed limit, consolidate trips, and then use the UPS trick where you organize your route in a clockwise pattern to minimize the left-hand turns. So you're not uh, idling, waiting for left-hand turns and you can turn right on red and right on the stop signs. <clears throat> so that's transportation. The next area, uh, the next highest area according to the study was 30, 27% uh, go is from natural gas usage. So the biggest natural gas user in your home is most likely your furnace. So for that, you want to make sure you've got insulation um, in your attic and weather strip and change your filters with regularity. <clears throat> then there, the next most likely, the next most high usage of natural gas is probably your hot water heater. So there it would run full loads only of the dishwasher and switch to cold water when you're doing laundry. Today's formulas for the detergents are designed to work in cold water and it, it works just as good. And you can, it, it's gentler on your clothes to use cold water. Colors last longer, darks stay darker and it's easier on your fabrics so your clothes last longer. So everybody should switch to cold water with their washing machine. And then, um, <clears throat> The other thing to do is to switch out uh, gas powered appliances for electric appliances as things age out. So instead of a, a gas powered hot water heater, you can get a heat pump hot water heater, a heat pump furnace, electric stoves, electric dryers, um, because uh, we can switch to electric because remember that the the um, Alameda Municipal Power source of electricities are all 100% renewable. So it's zero emissions to switch to electric. <clears throat> then the next area was 3% was waste and um, uh, water usage. So for that, you wanna focus on reduce, reuse, recycle and rot or compost and uh, to keep in mind, everything that we use takes energy to get the raw materials, manufacture it, ship it uh, ultimately to you with emissions at every step. So the more stuff we use, the more greenhouse gas emissions we're creating. So a good place to start on reducing, um, <clears throat> on reducing what we consume is to get rid of disposable single use items. So we haven't bought paper towels or paper napkins for decades now that uh, instead for uh, paper towels, I use a dishcloth and um, or a hand towel. Instead of paper napkins, we use cloth napkins. It feels kind of fancy. And um, use a reusable coffee mugs instead of paper cups. And instead of bottled water, use a refillable um, water container. <clears throat> so those are just some ways of reducing some of the single use items that we're used to. Then on recycling, it's important that when you put your glass or metal um, bottles or cans in the blue bin to rinse them out first so that you don't get food bits on the paper products, cross-contamination of paper products. That's an issue. <clears throat> and then for the green bin, it's for more than yard trimmings. It's for food and food soil paper products like pizza boxes or paper takeout containers. And it's really important to address this because green products like that, foods, food scraps and yard trimmings, uh, in a landfill without oxygen creates methane gas, which is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than um, carbon dioxide. Then one area that wasn't touched upon in the study was what we eat. And for, but that one's up there on the, on the chain of, of uh, how to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions is um, to really cut back first, cut back on beef and lamb because cows and sheep 
burp up methane gas, which is that powerful greenhouse gas. <clears throat> and then just cut back more on meat and go towards a plant-rich diet because it take, there's an awful lot of deforestation that occurs to graze animals and to grow crops to feed the animals. It's much more efficient just to eat the plants in the first place. Um, one thing I wanted to mention too is that it's important to uh, conserve electricity even though we're at 100% renewables because we wanna make sure that um, uh, AMP can maintain that 100% renewables as we get more EVs online. So it is important to change your light bulbs. And for those of you that put up solar panels, that's fantastic. That helps us keep it at 100% renewables. Um, <clears throat> then uh, going beyond ourselves to uh, uh, reduce carbon footprint is to plant trees. So you could get together with friends and plant trees in parks, working with the city. That's what we did with the um, <coughs> Rotary Club. Um, or you can get a street tree and on the back of the checklist is a contact of how you can order a street tree. Or what I do is um, donate to the Nature Conservancy, which not only uh, protects existing forest land, but does, they, they're doing reforestation. <clears throat> And then it's also important to realize that as you are reducing your carbon footprint, you're setting an example for other people. So especially if you talk about what you're doing with your friends and family. Um, I got into the habit of writing letters to the editor as I was changing my habits um, and shared what I was doing to reduce my carbon footprint. <clears throat> then um, the uh, League of Women Voters is already doing an amazing, amazing work on getting people to vote. Um, but it's important also to, once we get them in office, to contact representatives at all levels and let them know we care about climate change. And there is an app for that. It's called Climate Action Now. And it comes up with scripts that you can use to call your representatives on various bills that are happening or about to happen. So um, that's a really good app to use. And then you can volunteer or donate to organizations with protect, who protect the climate, like the ones that I described in the presentation. And that's all that I had for um, the presentation itself. We could go to the, the chat, Carol, what questions do we have? Let me oh, get George. out and stop sharing. Joyce, we have uh, two questions um, that are both referring to city assistance for some of these changes. One is about EV chargers for multifamily buildings. And the other is solar panels over schools and businesses. So is there a, a structured program right now for EV chargers uh, or solar panel assistance? There's, there's a structured program for EV chargers, and you can get more about that from the AMP website. They'll, they'll, uh, they have rebates for EV chargers, as well as for electrical panel upgrades if you need them for your, for your electric vehicle. And there is a series of uh, workshops going on right now, including for multifamily um, housing on EV chargers, so on EVs. So um, for that, you could go to the city website um, and search for uh, electrification and see what you, and you'll see the workshops. And then the other one was solar on schools. On schools and businesses, yeah. Um, there, there isn't a program that I know of for schools and there is for businesses. Go ahead, Ann, you know. I well, at least, oh, hold on. No, stop, Ann, you were fine. You're now muted. You actually muted yourself. <laughs> Here we go. Oh. 
It, it, it looks just the opposite on my screen. So sorry. Um, so, and this was a few years ago when they were looking at the um, original bond measure that is currently in place. And one thing that the district found is because AMP has renewable sources, they found that the costs of adding solar at that time anyway, uh, wound up not necessarily providing the benefits that people had anticipated because um, so now that was that was several years ago and there's been many changes but I know that you know that in our community anyways part of the advantages is we're utilizing renewable sources but I'm sure there's a much better explanation but I know that that was looked at at least by the school district and that was the that was sort of what where they ran into that it didn't really create any savings or even benefit but I could be wrong it's happened before <laughs> you know, and I think if I could jump in, that kind of brings up a point that making the conversion for reasons other than saving money might need to factor into the decision mm -hmm. or um, doing something for the planet, even though it wasn't cost effective to do it. Well, the first thing to do before you put in um, solar panel is to see about um, doing everything you can to make your home energy efficient. Then you have to put in less solar panels to pay for your own electricity. So the, the school district may have decided to focus on um, energy efficiency rather than solar panels mm -hmm. right off the bat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Any other questions, Carol? Um, that's all in the chat, but I have a question. Um, in terms of city administrators or officials, do you, are there any in particular who are very active? Oh, we've got, we've got one more question, but I'll, I'll ask you in that. Okay. Um, are there any that are, you feel are championing some of these actions that can be taken? Well, I think our mayor has been very supportive um, of the uh, climate action and resiliency plan and getting different initiatives taken care of. And But I haven't followed too closely about who has done, who has voted which way on certain things. So I don't think I'm qualified to answer that one. So we've got one more question here about empty parking lots. I know I've seen this quite a bit in Southern California. Uh, they can have solar panels on them. And mm -hmm. is there city assistance for that? Um, not that I know of, no. Okay. Yeah, a lot of the, the, the main focus that the city is working on now, rather than solar panels, is electrification of gas appliances. So they're looking at what are the sources of greenhouse gases in Alameda. The biggest one's transportation. So that they focused a lot on bicycling infrastructure for transportation and adding that line 78. The next biggest area is 30, per, almost 30% was natural gas. So they're focusing on electrifying appliances to get the natural gas down usage down. Nice. So that's the areas of focus currently. Okay, so we've switched to trees here, which I know has an active organization in Alameda. Uh, what is the plan to get more trees planted in new developments, especially trees that will cycle a lot of carbon? Not, not palm trees. trees. <laughs> well, there's a whole city plan for tree planting. Um, and part of the community action for, you no, know, what is it called? The, the CARP, community, uh, no, climate action for or, and resiliency plan, climate action and resiliency plan. There, I got it out of my brain. Um, <clears throat> calls for far more tree planting in, in, in the city of Alameda and developing a new tree plan. So I think that we will get more trees out in the new, new developments on the base. Okay. Those are all the questions in the chat so far. Okay. So any all right, and I, I have a couple. Yeah, for all right. Me. Yeah, okay. Um, so we banned leaf blowers because they had those little small two-stroke engines, right? Yes. All right, how come we didn't 
fan the lawnmowers because aren't those the same little two stroke engines that have the same exhaust? Well, that's a good question, Jeff. All right. Well, I know that you're not the guru of all the policy of the city. I just thought maybe if you had a some insight, but okay, that's fine. Uh, moving on, hydrogen cars. And the only reason I bring it up is uh, yesterday on NPR, they were talking about hydrogen as now kind of the up and coming thing for the future because um, it was taking more electricity, I guess, to make the hydrogen from the technology 10 years ago. Yes. And now there's some plasma physics thing, which you should know about. <laughs> Well, I don't know that one either, Jeff. Um, I was back on the time where it took more energy to create the hydrogen than it did, you know, so it wasn't an efficient use of, uh, an efficient way to get around. Um, the, as long as, you know, as long as we have 100% renewables, the um, electric vehicle is the way to go because that's zero emissions. That doesn't take anything. Okay, um, and then last question I had, um, it, we talk about what we've, oh, we've gotten over the certain point already or certain milestones in degrees warming. If we are able somehow by some miracle to reduce it back down, are the effects of climate change or at least the major ones, are those reversible? In other words, will we have less severe storms if we get the temperature back down lower? Well, it was, the the answer is yes, we could. You know, we could get less re, re, uh, severe storms if we got if we really went all out. But the, I don't think that's really realistic, considering the commitments that the people have made still have us well above the 1.5 degrees Celsius gain that the scientists are saying is the uh, what we need to get down to to mitigate to prevent the worst of the worst happening. Yeah. So, um, but I am a hopeful person and um, the more we can do on planting trees to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, as well as a, a whole bunch of work on reducing our emissions, that's the answer. Reforestation. Okay. Excellent. Okay, Carol, a quick check just to make sure there's nothing else in the chat. I, I saw some, okay, here we go. Here it goes, coming on in. Um, something, there's a question about nuclear power, which of course has so many sides to it, but because certain changes, for instance, in Germany were made so quickly, uh, there was now reconsideration of whether they should be uh, tapering down. So is there anything for nuclear design in the Alameda plan? Um, nothing in the Alameda plan, but as far as nuclear power goes, um, it is uh, zero emissions, so that's good. But then we have the problem of nuclear waste. Everything has trade-offs. And the other thing is that nuclear power is very expensive to build. And with all the regulations in place, it takes a long time to build them. So um, it's not the ideal solution for um, combating climate change because of that in the US, because it takes so darn long to get one constructed. And we don't have time for that anymore. One of, uh, one of our folks mentioned a particular company, put it in the link in the chat, Kairos Power. Okay. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, the other, let's see here. The other is, uh, what can we do to increase incentives for heat pump HVAC? Uh, I guess there's a program. Uh, yeah. There's that will help, but it costs three thousand uh, dollars, four times what a gas furnace would cost. Um, yeah, the the there is an incentive with AMP for um, heat pump water heaters. Um, 
but it still is going to be more expensive for the cost of the the, the cost of one of these is more expensive than a regular heater. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, they're far more efficient than a regular heater. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of, of it will pay back eventually. Um, <clears throat> and if you want AMP to increase the rebate, you can always participate in their um, meetings. And they're welcome to hear back from the public about rebates. We just had a meeting Tuesday night where Bike Walk Alameda was encouraging AMP to do rebates for e-bicycles in addition to electric vehicles. And they were very receptive to it. We'll see what they do. Okay. So far that's it in the chat. Okay. All right. Well, Joyce, I really want to thank you for a very well-organized presentation. I am a visual learner, so I really do appreciate the PowerPoint. Oh, and you're we welcome. The, and we got the graphics right and everything else. And Anne, I see you have, you're raising your hand. Yes, you know me. I always want to get one more thing in. Well, two things, actually, because I just finished um, watching um, the our national parks which is a series that's on Netflix right now. And I would recommend it because again, this sort of gets into getting the right people and uh, voted into powerful positions because it was very uh, interesting how throughout the world expanding these reserves is really um, in part designed to make a, a very big impact on the environment itself. And including, you know, I was very interested to hear about the kelp farms in and Monterey, the huge that they they mm -hmm. they do far more in changing. So, um, anyway, so I would highly recommend that. Just if anybody has not seen it, it is a beautiful series, and it talks about that. And then, if I can, just pop in a few little um, announcements. Uh, we it is that season, and so we are have the league in uh, cooperation with several of our other local chapters have been uh, putting on our campaign forums. Uh, the district attorney one was held on the 18th. I believe you can see that that was recorded and you should be able to have access to that. I don't know if already, but if not soon. But we have two more coming up. One is on the 25th for the, um, don't know that it impacts us so much, but the sheriff and coroner. But also on May 2nd is the superintendent of schools forum. If you're interested in attending any of those, you can you can find out information on our website, again, lwvalameda.org, and they play at, they always start at 6 o'clock. So a way to get information on uh, some of those that are running for uh, our county services, our county uh, positions. All right, just wanted to pop that in there real quick. <laughs> Great, appreciate it. Those, those are all virtual, right? Yes, all on Zoom, yeah, so you can virtual. just sit at, sit at home and watch it, or like I say, if you can't make that time, I do believe they are being recorded and can be made available afterwards. Excellent. Okay. Well, once again, I want to thank Joyce for the great presentation. Carol in the lower right-hand corner, thanks for keeping me honest on the chat. I really do appreciate that. And Keisha, I just see the LWV swash, but if you're there, thank you very much for making all of the technology work. And it is almost eight o'clock. For those of you that have dogs, it's time to walk your dog. And for the rest of you, have a great night. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you, Joyce. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. All right, take care.